the age of personalised medicine has arrived. Be sure to check out our new FX Medicine podcast series, FX Omics, with Dr. Mark Donoghue, brought to you by Bioceuticals Clinical Services. Explore the genomic landscape and the clinical opportunities enabling you to offer truly personalised healthcare. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Joining us on the line today is Beth Bundy. Beth's a qualified naturopath of over 20 years, specialising in integrative and functional medicine. She worked previously as technical consultant with PathLab, one of Australia's original functional pathology companies, and currently trains health practitioners nationally as clinical consultant at Nutropath Integrative Pathology Services, where she's in high demand as an engaging, informative speaker, she's a lot of fun. She also works as a functional medicine practitioner in a busy and highly successful integrative medicine practice. Welcome back to FX Medicine, Beth, how are you going? Good morning. Now we're gonna be talking about something very close to my heart, well below my heart, it's adrenal fatigue, but it's adrenal fatigue is a myth. Here's why. Indeed. Let's go into this. Where do the concept let's, of adrenal diss fatigue? It now. Yeah. <laughs> diss it. Where do the concept um, of adrenal fatigue begin? Well, our darling Hungarian, Hans Selye, uh, came up with this theory about 70 years ago of the general adaptation syndrome, or GAS, um, which I'm sure we've all suffered, um, <laughs> which is talking about um, how the body's physiological responses to stress. Um, and he talked about three stages. There was the alarm, resistance, and exhaustion, whereas in the initial phase, the body's reaction is the fight or flight. You know, we're ready for to run from the tiger or the bear. Um, and this is when our sympathetic nervous system comes online, adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol comes into the picture. Then the second stage is where we have a lowering level of stress because we've realised that maybe the tiger's not real. Um, and so we're looking after any damaged tissue and this is when the parasympathetic nervous system will come back in and things kind of return to normal in air quotes. I'm probably going to use a lot of air quotes today. Um, <laughs> we'll, we'll imagine your gip-gips. I know. <laughs> I so need to come with video and pictures. <laughs> but the normal level. Um, but your blood glucose will still remain high because cortisol and adrenaline will still be circulating. You know, you might still have an increased heart rate, blood pressure, Breathing, this is when people, you know, the shallow breathers, they might have palpitations. Um, so they're still on alert, um, but at a reduced level. Mm. And then in the exhaustion, more air quotes, uh, the body, you know, can't fight these stresses anymore, depletion of energy. And if it's not sorted out, this is when the health issues occur. You know, things like over long term, we get hormonal changes, we can get ulcers. Uh, hypertension, atherosclerosis, you know, some of these chronic conditions we know. But what I thought was interesting was that um, Salier himself had noted that stress, in addition to being itself, was also the cause of itself and the result of itself, mm. which I think that belongs on a T-shirt or a bumper sticker <laughs> somewhere. Um, but <laughs> I, um, I quite like that. And Another interesting thing I discovered that there is an American Institute of Stress, of course there is, um, in Texas, and even they concede, even though they, you know, they champion Cellier, they're now saying, oh, what he had to say wasn't really correct. Well, um, well, well but, yeah. See, I don't see it as necess being necessarily incorrect because we're talking about hormonal secretion, but I think the big mm. thing is this fatigue, this fatigue concept. To what yeah. organ do we attach it? That's yeah. uh, that's the issue. Like I, I just, it's really interesting. And I used to believe it. I mean, you know, I used to quote, you know, the, the adrenals shrivel. Really? Mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. So what well, happened? Yeah. We, you know, we all assumed that it was all to do with the adrenal gland, forgetting the signals to the adrenal yeah. gland. Mm. Uh, well, and the other thing is that in about the year 2000, um, Dr. James Wilson, a naturopath and chiropractor from the US, brought out the book, uh, Adrenal Fatigue, the 21st Century Stress Syndrome, which as I was relatively new to practice, um, it kind of became the gospel on treating adrenal fatigue, more air quotes, um, because that was a terminology he kind of brought up, this adrenal fatigue business. And if, and I would say most uh, practitioners of my era would own this book and live by it. And its general tenets are actually still hold true. Um, and the whole list of symptoms, there's the list of symptoms in the book with the fancy pictures. And I reckon you could put every client that comes through your door as saying that they've got these problems, you know, with the, um, you know, decreased ability to handle stress and getting tired, lack of energy, um, not, not relieved by stress. They can't get up in the morning, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this, so I think this really took hold of where that was the adrenal gland itself because he talked about, you know, he has pictures of adrenal glands yeah. suffering and being dragged down by all the stresses in the world. Um, so it's more about the stages that we kind of got hung up on, I think, and even when I'm talking to practice and we're discussing um, cortisol, salivary cortisol results, people go, oh, so what stage are they in? Uh, and I'm like, oh. Well, you know, it's not a, there's not three boxes that yeah. people fit in. How does your treatment change? Does yeah, that matter? Well, yeah, well, I know. It's just like you're putting labels on people. Yeah, and create a box. To a box. Mm. So um, I think what we need to probably, if I may, is um, go a bit about the three stages and try and go, well, this is kind of what the assumption has been, but this is more like how it works. Like when you say it's not just the adrenals, we have hormones further up the line uh, and we have a brain and that's kind of where it all starts. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's delve so, in. All right. So, <clears throat> so yeah, as I said, there's the stage model that um, it talks about the adrenal stress, the adrenal fatigue, the adrenal exhaustion. But what, and the theory is that the initial exposure to whatever the stress is, typically results in elevated cortisol and your DHEA will remain constant or even decrease. Um, now, the cause of the stress, the vitality and the age of the patient will determine the DHEA levels, um, whether they're lower than normal because age affects DHEA. We must always remember that. So the assumption is that the adrenal glands are being assaulted um, and they've got this excessive and prolonged um, excretion of cortisol. The adrenal glands can't cope. They get all, you know, overcome. And ultimately, this is where the theory of pregnenolone steel comes into play. So, um, you know, the theory about that is that all steroid hormones are derived from pregnenolone, which ultimately comes from cholesterol. And that if there's elevated cortisol, either by acute or chronic stress, this leads to less pregnenolone available to be the precursor to DHEA and other hormones. So in other words, the need for cortisol steals, more air quotes, pregnenolone away from the other hormones. All right, so that's where this pregnenolone steal came from. Um, so while we know that there, an increased cortisol is common in early and let's say midterm stress, the notion that there's this limited pool of for all hormones to work from is is where it's not right. Hmm. Okay, because the transformation from cholesterol to pregnenolone actually occurs in the mitochondria of each respective adrenal cortex cell. And so there's no kind of bucket of pregnenolone where one cell can steal from another. Um, and there's not a mechanism actually facilitating the pregnenolone jumping between the mitochondria of 
of the different cells of the different areas of the adrenal. So, like, you know, moving from the zona um, reticularis to the reticulata, they can't hop on a little magic carpet and pop over there instead. They don't immigrate um, to a better country, you know. Um, and I think this is some of the issue is because when we see diagrams of steroid pathways, because it's such a complex thing and we can't put that on a piece of paper, they kind of simplify it. And so we don't realise all the different regulations There's of all the different enzymes, your alphas and your betas and things with really long names, of how they affect, um, you know, what pregnenolone does. Okay, so we need to, can we just move up on the pregnenolone steel concept for a start? Um, so, because really what we do know is that prolonged stress does affect the HPA access, okay? And so cortisol is often driven higher. But this is caused by um, ACTH production or mm. um, adrenocorticotropic hormone. Let's just call it ACTH for E. And that activating the HPA access. And of course, then we see its feedback mechanisms. We see an adaptation by the HPA access. Um, now, this can be caused by an adaptation to a specific stressor. So, for example, overcoming the fear of speaking publicly on a podcast um, or a down regulation of the HPA to prevent damage from excessive cortisol or both. You know, it could be both. So that's the initial kind of thing that happens. And then we have the next stage, or the adrenal fatigue, big air quotes, um, whereas we've got chronic stress, and this is progressing to a more permanent downregulation of cortisol production via the HPA. Yeah. Um, and this is where sometimes we'll see that, you know, so initially on bloods you might see an elevated um, cortisol, but in this second stage where things are kind of being down, you know, quietened down, the cortisols will probably be in normal ranges. So you'll say to a patient, oh, you're fine. Um, but this is where you also may see your DHEA starting to get lower and you may see changes in the cortisol rhythm through the day because we know that cortisol has a diurnal rhythm, yeah, up in the, up in the morning and it lowers over the day and then should be very quiet overnight. So again, the assumption here is thought that the ACTH stays high and maybe even increase. The adrenals, again, um, are not responding. Again, pregnenolone steel is thought to contribute to keep that cortisol at a normal level at the expense of DHEA. And this is why it's called, well, it's adrenal fatigue because <clears throat> you're pushing it all to cortisol. However, as we've said, there's no evidence um, at present to so show that um, the actual part of the adrenals becomes insensitive to ACTH or even fails to respond to it. Um, it's, it's more likely that the lower cortisols are due to the downregulation of HPA turning down the ACTH production, which would turn down the cortisol. Yeah. And you've also got to remember if people are on um, glucocorticoids or they're on cortisone, then that's a natural feedback mechanism that will quiet things down as well. And the other thing is we have to remember cortisol binding globulin. So this is where you might see um, high, high to normal high cortisol in the blood but then when you look at your saliva cortisol, it's really low. Um, and this is because we have cortisol binding globulin that's, you know, hanging onto it all um, and it's not bioavailable. So, again, this is about the body protecting itself um, from cortisol damaging effects long term. Just like we have sex hormone binding globulin, so we don't have our hormones raging around all the place. Um, and we have things like reverse T3 that sometimes can quiet down the thyroid to calm our thyroid. So, <clears throat> so remember that this is actually the downregulation of this HPA access is a protective mechanism, so we don't all spontaneously combust. Yeah, that's right. Third stage is um, that the ACTH levels are now going to be constant, 
And that's when this the whole exhaustion thing. It's like, nah, the adrenal glands have gone nuts. Nah, I'm shutting up shop. I cannot cope with what you're asking me to do. But it's just not true because now we've got, um, again, the low levels of DHA and cortisol is really more about the chronic HPA downregulation that now then turns into a bit of a metabolic dysfunction as well. And this is when we have more difficulty treating our patients because this has been going on a long time and like their sort of metabolic reserves um, are all lower and just everything's turned down. So we have to start turning them up slowly. Um, Now, what we have to be aware of is using the word adrenal fatigue because then people go to doctors and the doctor goes, what's poppycock? But this can be differentiated from true adrenal insufficiency where, um, you know, there is problems with ACTH by measuring ACTH. You know, I, I think a lot of practitioners just stick with cortisol saliva and, you know, you really have to look at the blood cortisol and ACTH to have a look if there's That's a real That's a very problem. good point. Absolutely. Prove, prove your oh. hypothesis. Absolutely. And we've actually found, if we've been a little bit more diligent in doing ACTH on patients uh, in clinic. And I'd say we've found in as many as three years, we've actually found three patients with Addison, with true oh. adrenal. Oh. Wow. Yeah. yeah. By measuring ACTH and finding it slow, measuring it again just to make sure there wasn't a wobbly. Mm. Yep. Sending them off for um, there's a test called a short synaxin test um, where they inject them with um, cortisol mm. or is it ACTH? It must be cortisol, and then they measure their cortisol response. So we've found uh, three adisonial patients with that. Whereas if we had have just kept them on a uh, varying different ages too, I must say, and if we had have just kept measuring through salivary cortisol. They would have kept coming back saying, I still feel like, you know, rubbish. Um, you know, your herbs aren't working. And mm. no, they're not because these people need hydrocortisone therapy for life. So um, it, really this needs to be, if you're not getting anywhere with someone, I would definitely say to consider ACTH and cortisol in the blood and refer them on to a medical doctor for specialist endocrinology treatment if needs be. I haven't looked it up yet, but I was thinking that test would probably be ACTH, wouldn't it? Because if you gave them cortisol, you're really looking at the end target organ secretion rather than yeah. what would control that secretion. Yeah. And I'll, I, I'll look I that haven't up. looked that up. I'll yeah, look that look up that and up I'll, I'll, I'll post the results on, um, on the FX Medicine website. The notes. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I know we just look at the, um, <clears throat> I just send them off for the test and we look at the results and I, I just look at the numbers. I right? mm. to have a look at what they're looking at. But, uh, yeah, so that's, that's been really worthwhile. Um, because as I say, you can't just put someone in a box and say, oh, you're adrenally fatigued when they're also a shift worker, um, they've got diabetes and, you know, perhaps some autoimmune condition as well. Um, so they don't just fit into that adrenal box. There's a whole lot of other things going. So, um, And the most important thing is don't just rely on a test result. You know, you've got to take your diagnostic and your history taking into the thing, plus your lab findings. It's the whole picture. You know, when I have crackies say to me, oh, look at this result, what does it mean? I'll say, well, can you tell me something a bit more about the patient? Because... Right. We can't just go off the off the piece of paper. Um, piece of paper with a number on it, you know. Robot, um, robotic diagnosis. Yes, it's it's just not like that. So um, always have to take their story in. I think uh, you know I've got to give kudos to two great doctors, and that's um, Dr. Andrew Heyman and Dr. David Harsey, mm-hmm. who really like you know mm-hmm. shook the ground. Um, they really woke a lot of people up me included, when they sort of said, you know, and I remember Andrew Heyman asking a question and just saying, you know, adrenal fatigue, really? And he said, prove it. So it was a very interesting learning experience for me. And there's a great paper that really explains this well. It's um, Bruce McEwen, um, Protective and Damaging Effects of Stress Mediators 
uh, published in New, e New England Journal of Medicine in 2008. And it will poignantly explain why we have the wrong vernacular. It's not the wrong mm. treatment. It's just the wrong mm -hmm. vernacular. Get yeah. rid of the word adrenal out of fatigue. And fatigue. Yeah, just call it fatigue. <laughs> it's, they're fatigued. Um, they're just fatigued, Don't yeah. try and blame a certain gra bla gland because you're looking at the wrong gland and it might misdirect your treatment. Andrew Heyman, uh, forgive me, David Harsey has some beautiful, uh, I think it's PET scanning images showing brain volume changes. You know, mm -hmm. and Andrew Heyman speaks about this, about the hippocampal changes and the prefrontal cortex changes, things like that. I just think it's really interesting how we get suckered into a nice, simple, you know, rolls off the tongue uh, concept. And the fact of the matter is the body doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> the body's really quite complex. No, it doesn't roll off the tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I should I should stop there, shouldn't I? I think you should stop there. Then we'll, we'll get a uh, so, high rating. Um, so about the, these changes. Uh, yeah, you, you know, so we need to change the vernacular, yeah, yeah, because the term, interestingly, the term adrenal fatigue, air quotes, uh, is virtually absent from any peer-reviewed literature and and the endocrine society is so up in arms about this that they've even put out public warnings against the diagnostic myth of adrenal fatigue yeah. and suggest you should cast suspicion upon clinicians using such terms. Yeah. Um, and I'll actually give you the link to the, to what they sent out. So um, that you, um, you guys can add it to the show notes. Yeah. And there's been some, uh, it wasn't a meta-analysis, what's the other one? A systemic review. Right. Also saying that there is no hard evidence for the existence and there is no actual medical condition called adrenal fatigue, so it is still a myth. Yeah. Um, and even the endocrinologists believe that under stress, your adrenals work harder and make more cortisol, not less. So well, this is, look, this is something I remember asking at a seminar, you know, the, the literature is awash with high cortisol causing metabolic issues. And even when I hear the term flattened cortisol response, it does not necessarily mean low. You can have flattened and high. It just means there's no drop. Yeah, that's right. There's just no rhythm. There's yeah. no uh, ebb and yeah. flow to it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. You know, and as I, I, I remember learning this, the we speak about, you know, um, the general adaptation syndrome and you get, you get, um, what is it? What's it called? Allostasis and then adaptation mm -hmm. um, with chronic or, or repeated stressors. And that is basically what, what that leaves you with is your allostatic load. Um, I'm trying to, in my mind, picture this diagram. I, and I'm pretty sure it's in that um, Bruce McEwen paper. But the interesting thing that got me was the graphs whereby normally under a repeated same stressor, we get a learned response. We learn that it's not going to kill us. So we yeah. go, yeah, another electricity bill. I get it. You know, people in business will say, yeah, another bass statement. Okay. You know, that sort of thing. It's like, yeah, whatever. But the, whereas the first one used to freak them out. So we mm -hmm. learn to live with the stressor. We learn to live with the lion. But what well, happens? Well, we've turned down. We've turned down our reactive that, button. That's right. We've coped. Yeah. Um, yeah. But what happens with a maladaptive syndrome is that the peaks keep going. Yes. They keep keep having this stress response, an anxious yes. response to the same stress all day in day out. Well, because that was what really interested response. me. Yeah. Yeah, it's the meerkat. Is your little um, amygdala, you know, keeps firing off. So you forget that there's no real tiger behind the best statement or what have you. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And so they overeat, overreact kind of yeah. thing. Yeah. And in, the, in so many ways, it's not just a feeling of stress. Your gut reacts, your immune reacts, your thyroid can react. So we're talking about a reaction from your adrenal, your thyroid, your immune system, whatever, but it's not the cause. Yeah, that's, that's it. So this is where we need, you know, when we talk about the vernacular and we need to just kind of remind people that adrenal insufficiency is true is true deficient production of or action of your glucocorticoids, so of your cortisol or your aldosterone, yeah? Mm. And this has serious life-threatening consequences. This is not like, oh, I'm really fatigued and I can't go to work or get out of bed. Oh, they like, drop. 
they, yeah. And and really now once I've seen these patients, you go, my God, like one lady, 75 before we discovered her. So oh my goodness. And she's a, I tell you what, you Stick. blow her over and, you know, you can yeah. blow on her and she'd fall over because she's whisk of a woman. And, it's, and she has terrible problems. The other, you know, she's so osteoporotic now and she's got all these other problems because it was not met, you know, or not discovered mm. way earlier, mm. you know. So, um, poor darling. Anyway. Oh, look, I, I remember a, a friend and a sort of friendly acquaintance many years ago and she was under so much stress and we just thought it was stress. And I went, Tracy, look, there's something else here. You know, her muscle wasting, there was just, mm-hmm. there was no, she stopped having her periods. There was no form to her skeletal mass, if you yeah. like. She was really wasting away. And did a colour change? I, a big colour changes yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, and she was she would just drop. She but she was under this chronic stressor um, from an employer, and I mm. said, "You've you've got to get out." That's number one. I said, "You've got to go see yeah. somebody." And sure enough, I think she was diagnosed as Cushing, uh, as um, Addison. Addison. Forgive me. Forgive Addison. me. Addison. Yeah, Addison. Now yes. it is rare, so you're not, they're not going to come through your door all the time. Um, it's just that we do a lot of fatiguing people, so we've come across three in three years, right? Because that's Probably not what general practitioners. I mean, doctors may, but certainly not oh, other, pick it up. Um, yeah. allied health will come across. So you could say so that. Remember that primary adrenal insufficiency is Addison's disease, yeah. right? Then we have secondary adrenal insufficiency. So that sorry, the primary adrenal is when yes, the adrenals are not yeah. working. Yeah, right. They're not listening to the message. Secondary adrenal insufficiency relates to where the ACTH either is not coming down the pathway or that the adrenals are not responding to that, right? So, again, that's a true medical condition and that's where the ACTH, um, or the short synaxin test will kind of pick up. And it's measured. Then you have... That's the thing. It's measured. You can measure ACTH. That's it. Exactly. Then the tertiary adrenal insufficiency is when further up the tree your uh, CRH or your corticotropin releasing hormone is um, um, not, not being stimulated uh, you know, that, to that, stimulate the yeah, release well, of that, ACTH. Yeah, and that's you get this CRH um, suppression. And so it's, you know, further up the tree is primary, secondary, tertiary. Yeah. Um, and any of those true adrenal insufficiency will need uh, hormone replacement. Mm. Okay, um, um, because they're not working. Then there's also the hypocortisolism, also hypocortisol, and that can be morning or daily, yeah. where the cortisol will be well below the reference range, but this still doesn't indicate fatigue of the adrenal gland. No. But you might see this in post traumatic stress, chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, you know, chronic stresses, like people have got really. Long, long stresses. Yeah. Um, uh, certain depressive or affective conditions. Um, again, this is likely an adaptive response to previous high cortisol production by either the hip camp or hypothalamus, pituitary, what have you, um, to protect the tissue. So, you know, because imagine if post traumatic stress, if there were stresses, they were, you know, on, on alert for whatever reason. So then they get down-regulated, yeah, and so then their cortisol is just that. Like you say, they're coping. Well, it's a, a false sense of coping because um, it's just that everything's been turned down yeah. and they're not working. So really, you know, with all we've talked about with the HPA, it's probably a more appropriate term we should be using is HPA access dysfunction or maladaption. Yeah. Um, because it's on... You know, it's from the brain to the adrenals. It's the whole trip down that evolves. So somewhere in there, um, it, it's more a maladaption. And I tell you what, you've mentioned a couple of papers. This is not a paper. This is an actual book, but I would like to mention it to everyone because I'm this. I'm a new fan girl of this fellow. Yeah. Who it's um Thomas Gilliam. Uh, he's a PhD, so he is a a Dr. Gilliam. And he's had a book called The Role of Stress and the HPA Access in Chronic Disease Management. 
Um, again, I'll give you um, the details so you can add to the show notes. Great. Um, but it is, for the nerds who like to read lots, it goes right into the depth of all of these different things. He's got fabulous little graphical pictures to show you how it all works. And you look at this and you go, oh, yeah, makes so much sense. And and I love it. Anybody who wants to investigate this will have these, oh, yeah, moments. Like, how was I ever suckered into that term? You yeah. know, it's really interesting. You know, when you talk about the immune response that ha- that happens later, people under chronic stress, they have, as you spoke about, the coping mechanisms or the coping phase, and then the maladaptive phase where their immune system starts to trigger. And this is where you see more things like, I've been stressed for years, years and I've now got chronic allergies, or I've now developed an mm-hmm. autoimmune disease or mm-hmm. something like that. You know, they, they might've been primed at birth but they weren't triggered then. Exactly. And that's why people seem to not think they go, oh, how did I get this? Well, it's not just, oh, because of one thing. I mean, look, I know there are things you can say, yes, you've got anemia because you've got no iron. But Mm. um, generally, when we have these chronic conditions or these nondescript conditions, they're a jigsaw puzzle of things. They're not a, a, a thing entirety. So... I cannot say, how did this happen? I don't actually know because I don't know all the things that have gone in to make you. Mm. Um, I don't know all of you, how you reacted as a child to something versus someone else, what you were predisposed to, blah, blah, blah. But the um, the Gilliam book, it's only a little book, but, yeah, it, it, it's I've actually moved James Wilson out of the way to pop this book on in Pride and Place in my um Okay. Yeah, the big thing um, is the the vernacular. I, I really do think yes. you know, and yes. and indeed, there thereby we should be looking at perhaps tailoring. Our, I I wouldn't say the word change, but tailoring our treatment strategies to involve more brain supporting nutrients and and strategies. Um, well, because yeah, well, that's where you because get. Because we don't need to change. It's just that we don't have to say, oh, you're adrenaline fatigued. You take, hmm. you know, withania. You are adrenaline stressed. You take something, you know, valerian. Ginseng, valerian. So, I mean, this is the classic thing. What does American ginseng work on? You know, what we talk about. Up higher higher the tree. Yeah, it works in the brain. Uh, What what does um, phosphatidylserine do? Oh, phosphatidylserine. You know? I love it. It is one of our, if not, the the top selling product we have in um, in clinic. Mm. Um, It's. It's great, and it actually works up at the ACTH, you know, and CRH level. Yeah, yeah. So it's fabulous. I say to patients, you know, if, especially if they're highly anxious and, and cortisol driven, um, I will say, you know, when you feel like an eleven out of ten, said so phosphatidyl can bring you down to a seven or eight out of ten, so you can go, okay, I'm a little bit more managed now, and now I can, you know, cope a bit better. Um, so I, I don't think we need to change our therapies. It's just because ultimately, just like emergency vehicles need to use the same roads for non-emergency functions, um, uh, do you know what I mean? We're, we're all using the same channels. It's just some things are busier than others sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So we can still use the same. But the biggest thing I would say is not necessarily about having to, you know, again, give people something. How about just sleep? Sleep oh. is the most important thing you can do for your HPA access. A, a proper sleep, like um, there's, um, you know, studies that show only two late nights or, or two nights with a shortened sleep will increase your cortisol. Yeah. Only two nights. Yeah. How many people have restless nights, you yeah. know? Um, you need to expose yourself to daylight. Uh, you know, we can't go Nature. from... Nature. Yeah, you need to be out there in the sun because that is where we're a circadian rhythm kind of animal. So we need light and, and dark and we need to go to sleep in a dark room and then wake up to the sunlight. Um, you know, like even I sometimes, especially in winter, I get up in the dark, jump in my car, um, drive to work into an underground car park, stay in a, a, a room that has no windows. I do not have windows in my clinic room. Um, leave at night in an underground car park and drive home in the dark. So 
you know, there's days in winter that I don't see the sunlight. And that's why I'm probably a bit cranky in the winter, just <laughs> quietly. Um, mental yeah, note. So, <laughs> mental note, don't talk to me in winter. <laughs> She's much a summary girl. Um, yeah, but, you know, how many people are doing that and they're not getting the sun and, um, you know, they're staying on their smartphones, head down and bum up sort of thing. Exercise is also, you know, we've got to get people moving and they go, oh, I'm too tired to exercise. Oh, for God's sake, you can go and have a walk. Yeah. You know, yeah. actually low intensity exercise lowers cortisol levels. That's, that's raised a little concept in, in my brain here. And that okay. is about the about our stress and how we, stress begets stress. You know, that yeah. beautiful saying that you said earlier on, oh, we're going to put that one up on the website too. I reckon that's great. But one thing that Lise Alshler has taught me is this to be cognizant of the concept of gratitude and how yeah. that amazingly quickly changes your feelings of anxiety of that egocentricity, if you like, the feeling of gratitude. Now, how do you give somebody that? How do you teach them to um, experience gratitude? That is a big key, particularly well, for somebody down the dumps, you know? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And I guess that's the thing is if you give them, you know, little things like saying, well, let's talk about your sleep. Let's get you a little bit of walking exercise. Let's get you breathing better. Mm, I mean, yes. I, I, you had a lovely podcast with our lovely Mim, uh, Mim Bean, when she talked about um, the take breathing. So breathing is important because remember how we said when you're in that stress response, you're breathing, you know, it's your heart thumping, um, you're breathing uh, really quickly to, to expend energy to run away from something. Um, so then a lot of us get stuck in this shallow breathing. We don't get this true breathing, which is actually calming. It's that heart rate, um, what do they call it? Heart, heart rate, rate variability. variability yeah. yeah. So I think probably teaching people, I've had people sit in my office and I haven't done the Pateco, um training, but I've had people just sit in my office and I say, and, and I've taught them how to breathe into their belly. Just, you know, because I say, see how you breathe, and, you know, their little shoulders go up and down. And I go, no, 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 mm. shoulders shouldn't move. Let's, I want to see your belly expand. Mm. And I've had to spend like 10 minutes showing someone how to breathe, to fill their lungs and consciously breathe sort of thing. So I can have them calmed in my chair there just by breathing and, and concentrating on a breath. So, which, because therefore that's a little bit of heart rate variability, um, just things like that, that triggers, and it's probably all little proprioceptors that I can't name at this present time, but that's triggering things back to the brain to go, shh, it's okay, mm. the tiger is Really gone, interesting or, stuff, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing we have to get people to, so this is before we've even given them any supplements, is how about eating properly too, you know? Carb, 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 which is this is what I find my cortisol, my really fatigued people will go for the quick fix and they'll go for the sugar high or caffeine high. And what we have to remember is hypoglycemia is a trigger for cortisol release. Yeah. So if you're bouncing around um, with your sugar up and down, up and down, um, your, your cortisol is bouncing around as well, which will elevate your blood sugar. And then the number of people that come in and say, I'm fat, I want to lose weight, fix me, it's like, oh, babe, we have to go back and we have to calm your farm before we can get rid of your fat, you know, Yeah. Um, because we're going to put on fat as a protection mechanism because we've got all this cortisol and blood sugar swimming around. Mm. And then we need to do all of that and talk to them seriously about that before we bring in our beautiful adaptogenic herbs and our nervines and our vitamins. And vitamin C is important and B-complex is important. Um, phosphatidyl should be a staple um, for some of these people. Mm. And, of course, then you have to assess these people and treat them. Where Inflammation, where is inflammation coming from? Have they got insulin resistance? You know, um, it, it's, it's not just a supplement. I think it's interesting to note, though, you know, like if you give a B vitamin supplement, a complex, 
to somebody mm-hmm. that's in the first stage of ad- of adaptation where they're really pretty much coping. They might be feeling the stress, but it's not like a wave over their head. They're feeling yeah. stress, but they're, they're okay. They're not liking it. The response that you'll get from giving them a B supplement or even a multivitamin is different from somebody who's way down the line. They're, they've been battered down. They're yeah. hammered yeah. flat. Yeah. And these people actually respond so much better to things like phosphatidylserine, the B5, B6, B complex, you know, magnesium, all of these great minerals, the adaptogens, the nervines. So they respond much better indeed to a point where sometimes you can get somebody who's quite sensitive to these and you've got to be a little bit cautious in how you give these, particularly when they've got the immune issues and stuff like that. Yeah, you just can't go in all guns blazing. And Mm. and interestingly, what you say about the coping, I find that, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, I love when people sit in my chair opposite me and they're talking about that. We talk about stress and they'll say, you know, and they've just told me that their business went under, they were bankrupted, they got divorced, they're still in court with their husband, Um, you know, there's all these things, their mum just died, blah, blah, and they tell me that, oh, but I'm not stressed. Yeah. And I'm like, I I just go, really, then what are you sitting in my chair for? (laughs) Um, Get out and let me have someone who's really got a problem. I just go, oh, you know, it becomes... (laughs) <laughs> God, <they're stressed. laughs> uh, it's just that it's their their reaction and how they are has become their normal. Air yeah, quotes again. Normal. Um, this is because it's this down regulation. They think they're coping and that they're okay. It's just become their normal. So, but it doesn't mean it's normal. Do you know what I mean? It's it might be common for them, but it's not normal. Yeah. You know. So, and this is where I have to explain to them. It's like, well you've come this way, you've got to this point, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, but, you know, the the business thing or the divorce thing or the death thing was five years ago. I go, yeah, but what's happened, you know, if you're 45, what's happened in the last 40 years? It's not just about what happened five years ago. Yeah. Do you ever employ the amino acids, like you know, like GABA, which is, like, I'm not convinced that it does cross the blood-brain barrier as GABA. Um, yeah. but it certainly seems to work in the gut from the research I've read. But how, like I, I've spoken to people, indeed some people that use it vet in, in a veterinary veterinary sense. Um, oh. Yeah, with really good effect. I think it's really interesting how it works, but I'm wondering how often do you employ things like GABA and L-theanine? I, I, I definitely, I love L-theanine. I do use GABA, not as a you know, not as a stalwart, but I, I, I have used it when I really need to, you know, I love carver. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, I love carver, especially for those people that are pinging um, to, again, help turn them down and bring them from an 11 out of 10 down to a 7 or an 8. Yeah. Um, I do find that things like the carver, the gabba, the, um, what was the other thing I said, L-theanine, mm. um, um, I, I do use, uh, 5-HTP too. Oh, sometimes. yes. Yep, yes. On Just be cautious because... of what else is around there. But it works so well. Oh, indeed, depending on what they're on, and I monitor them closely. Yeah. Um, but there are other things because your neurotransmitters are definitely play a part of this. You know, again, we're stuck on the adrenals, and now we've been talking about, well, it's, the message comes from the brain, but so do your neurotransmitters. Mm, feedback. And, and, that's, and melatonin is a neurotransmitter. And you make that from serotonin. So, you know, you, your cortisol might be um, low, but if your melatonin is as well, then you're not going to get a quality, restful, restorative sleep. Mm. So, you know, this is where, um, you know, some of the medical practitioners uh, then instigate um, prescribing melatonin, or they might even use pregnenolone and um, DHEA um, because, one of the other things from progesterone, so this is especially important like when we're dealing with our ladies too, that progesterone, one of its um, metabolites is allopregnenolone, right, which mm-hmm. um, is a precursor for GABA, yeah? So right. sometimes when our ladies are really um, stressed out and pinging out, you also have to deal with their hormones and upregulate their progesterone so they can make the allopregnenolone, which is, you know, 
this is what calms our ladies. Gotcha. This is why our PMS ladies are a little bit, you know, let us just say not quite right. Um, that's why that's why men have sheds. We yep. know that. Um, and but some of that will be the allopregnanolone. And so again, sometimes when we treat these ladies with uh, oral progesterone, that helps upregulate their allopregnanolone, which then helps upregulate their GABA, and they can be, you know, a bit more relaxed and calmer. In wrapping up, we need to measure the right things. Don't just think that it's all in the adrenals. Measure measure things that the the adrenals affect and are affected by other glands. Um, make sure of what condition you're dealing with, because there may be an underlying un, undiagnosed condition that really requires medical attention and pharmacological intervention. Help people cope from an emotional level and their stress or level. Um, we know that we can't get, you know, solve everybody's problems, but we can certainly try and intervene to try and, you know, see if they can look at things a different way and maybe have a better coping mechanism. And I think that's a real key for the 21st century. Eating right, sleeping right, and where appropriate intervene with some judicial supplements? Yeah, I think it's about, get, you know, really having an education of the patient that we do not have a pill for an ill. Mm. We do not have a... For, usually when patients say to me, well, is there just something I can take? I say, yeah, you can pop down the local... I'm sure they've got some tablets that'll give you a bit of an upper. Uh, but that's, you know, that's... That's not health. And that's not health. That's not healthy. That's not helpful. Whereas... If we can educate them, well, you took a, you took quite a while to get to this state. It's going to take us a little while to get you out of this state, and these are all the things you need to do to help assist. Yeah. Because those are all the things that you weren't doing properly that um, got you into this mess in the first place. Yeah. So yeah, and then of course there is the testing, but you know, and then that's a whole other maybe that's a whole other podcast yet again because we've got different ways of testing. Let's get you back and we can talk more about which testing is appropriate when. Yeah. All right. Great, Beth. Sounds too. Done. Stay Steve. tuned, everybody. <laughs> I love I love your analogies and thank you so much for that quote. We're gonna definitely gonna put that up on the FX Medicine uh, website for our listeners. Thank you so much, um, Beth Bundy Fabulous. for joining us today. Bye everybody. This is FX Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook. The Bioceuticals Integrative Medicine Awards are fast approaching. The Beamers showcase the outstanding talent we have in the Australasian integrative medicine profession and are held in conjunction with the Bioceuticals Research Symposium. To book your ticket to this gala dinner event, visit bioceuticals.com.au and click on the Education tab.